Hi guys, thanks so much for watching. Speaking of, I'm really excited today because I'm gonna be talking to my friend Laquanda. She is the jack of all trades or queen of all trades and I'm excited to tell you guys some things about her and learn some more about her myself. So again, I'm Stephanie and we're gonna be talking to Laquanda. And with that, Laquanda, we are going to dive right in. And I, okay. well, it's amazing that you are a native Charlestonian. Yes. That's like being, I don't know, like on the endangered species list. Nobody <laughs> is actually a native Charlestonian. But what yeah. is that like? What was that like seeing, you know, growing up in Charleston, seeing that it evolve how it has now? Charleston is home to me. It's home to my parents. Um, and I, as much as I enjoy South Carolina and I enjoy Charleston, I just hate to see how much we've grown. I'm used to seeing like this small little town, a lot of dirt roads, less traffic, people riding bikes and, you know, walking a bit. Um, but now it's just like hustle and bustle. And granted, you know, we're not as big necessarily as you would say Charlotte, North Carolina is. Um, but it's definitely, definitely evolved. Pros and cons to that. Um, but it, it still kind of breaks my heart just to see how big we've gotten, big and congested, I'll say that. Like I can deal with growing, but the congestion, is what kills me. Like there's a bank on every corner. There is an apartment next to that. Like there's just not a lot of trees. It's not a lot of nature. It's not a lot of just what I grew up seeing. That is a unique perspective. Cause like to me, I lived in Charleston for 11 years starting in 2008 or 2000. Yeah. The end of 2008. And so by then it was already significantly more built up than it was. I'm sure as you remember, cause I don't recall right. it dirt roads, but right. It was also nowhere near as built up as it was when I left, you know, six or seven months ago. I mean, I guess the the pro to it too is that we've gotten a lot of bigger businesses, so it's brought a lot more jobs here, um, and it's created more of a melting pot kind of feel too. So, I mean, those are pros, but pros. Um, but I definitely, definitely can say I hate the amount of cars that we have. <laughs> so if we could just get everybody on some kind of a subway or get the bikes going, then you'll be good. I'll be happy. Yeah. I will be happy. <laughs> <laughs> you have three kids. How do you think the experiences growing up for them in Char this Charleston versus growing up when you were there? For them, when I tell them about back in the day, it's kind of like, what? Ride bikes everywhere. What? Walk? What are you talking? No, that's not good, mom. And I'm just like, uh, actually, yeah, it is. Um, so for them, like hearing my stories about before they came along to now, it's kind of like literally night and day for them. And they can't even envision it being different. Like they like the hustle and bustle. Granted, they don't like being in the car, stuck in traffic as long as we are most days. If you live in Charleston, where do you go for vacation? I go to beaches and it sounds crazy because it's like, well, you have a beach here. And I'm like, yeah, but it's not the same. Like going beaches, other places, the sand is different. I know that's going to sound crazy to people. The sand is different. Um, the color of the water is different. It's just, it's different. And I like that part. I like being outside and smelling the salt and that kind of thing. And it's just like, being here in Charleston and going to Isle of Palms or Sullivan's Island, granted those are lovely beaches, um, but you know, sometimes just new scenery. So where's your favorite place that you've been? What's your favorite beach? Panama City Beach. Mm, I've never been there. We went on that trip with some friends um, and I guess it was more or less the experience along with it that made it a lot different. And being with the crew of friends that they don't mind trying different foods. Um, they're kind of like, okay, let's go jet skiing. Let's, you know, do things that we've never done. So I think it was more or less, not necessarily just the beach itself, but the entire experience that made that one better than most. What's the difference in Laquanda with her kids and Laquanda with her friends? I am very cut and dry with my kids. I believe in structure with my kids and kind of keeping them on a schedule. Um, I mean, granted, there's time to, you know, let loose, but just kind of keeping them aligned so that they understand these are the things that you need to do. Once you're done with those things, I don't care what you do, that kind of thing. So I'm more structured with them versus with my friends. I enjoy not 
having structure, not having a calendar or calendar invites to plan my life. Like that's, that's the difference. And my friends actually enjoy the on and off button, the mom Wakanda versus the non mom Wakanda. Mm -hmm. You mentioned a couple of things there that reminded me of corporate life. You said aligned, which sounded a very corporate term <laughs> and then calendar invites. So how do you manage corporate life with three kids? I don't think I have a recipe for success with it. I think that I'm just a do it kind of person. Like I, with trial and error, I've had to learn that it is important to separate your life, your personal life from work. Um, within the past few years, I've definitely had to learn that and go through the challenges of that. Being able to say, okay, after this time of night, I'm not even gonna pay attention to my work phone. This is a time that's dedicated to me, or this is a time that's dedicated to my kids. And I had to physically teach myself how to be comfortable with, on a weekend, it's okay not to respond to an email right then and there if I'm at a basketball game or at a football game with my kids. I've had to personally teach myself that that anxiety yeah. has to go away because in order for you to be a functioning human being, male or female, you have to have that separation and you have to teach yourself that separation. Granted, I learned how to do that separation very late in life, um, but I'm, I'm happy and I'm proud that I'm at a point now where I don't feel guilty about taking my Saturday to myself or taking my Sunday to myself or taking the afternoon to really enjoy my son at football practice or at a football game. Um, and like I said, it, it's very challenging, especially when you're that person who has a checklist for your day and you do exactly what your, your checklist says and kind of being able to say, you know what, I did the important bullets um, this is something that can wait till tomorrow because I want to cook, make cupcakes with my girl. It is challenging. Like even hearing you talk about, you know, not looking at the email or responding to the email, I could feel that <laughs> inherent fear that you get when those emails come and you're like, and then it's like, does some, does it say red? Does somebody know? Didn't they know that I read <laughs> that? Who do I have to reply to? It's that terror and it is tough to get yeah. over that. Yeah. What would you tell, because you have one son and two daughters, so what would you tell your daughters about growing up and trying to manage the, the balance? Because I think for men, it is not necessarily easier, but I think it's... Um, it's different. It's different. It's I a think different experience. Many situations, you know, the mom's there and the mom's the one who's, if there's a pediatrician appointment, it's the mom that's going to be the one who has to figure out how to take off work. Right. So how do you you know, coach your girls or try to teach them, you know, how are they going to do it? You know, what, what are they doing versus what you're telling your son or how does that look? For my girls, I think the one thing that I constantly remind them of is that you don't have to do it all. It's okay to be a know-it-all, but you don't have to do it all. Um, so being able to be comfortable in your space enough to say, you know what, I need you to grab that or I need to delegate this to someone else and, and relinquishing that control, right? Because us as women, we tend to be a little more controlling and it's not because we have to be in control, it's that we want to monitor from start to finish so that there's a successful outcome. So being able to teach them now that it's okay to delegate things, it's okay to move things around, it, it, it's okay. Me two plus years ago to me now, my girls even see a difference. Like there was a point in time where they're like, gosh, mom, you're always working. So now it's like, okay, you know, mom, are you going to go to practice with us today? Yep. They don't even look or, you know, think twice about it. It's like, okay, because that's the new norm. How did you come to that revelation? What triggered it? I think it was, I literally sat down one day and I think I was just so frustrated with the amount of things that were sitting on my plate. And I literally had to say to myself, like, to some degree, I'm doing this to myself. I'm making myself anxious. I'm making myself tired. I'm making myself superwoman when it's okay because even superwoman and superman take off their cape every now and then. It's okay to provide my feedback, but I don't have to be the answer to everything. And so weaning myself back and starting to look at things from those perspectives definitely made it different and made it easier. 
But yeah, I, I literally had to have a come to Jesus with myself one day and just be like, you know what? This isn't working. That's really cool. I loved so many of the things you said there. I loved the, the superheroes take off their capes. And I liked, you know, providing feedback, but not being the solution. Cause I think that yes. it's so easy to get caught up and like, you know, when somebody puts something on you, I think as a woman, sometimes it feels like you have to have that answer yes. and you have to figure it out. And if you don't, you kind of feel like you failed or like you can't be trusted. Right. And you're right. You don't have to be. Sometimes you can just say, I need help and that's okay. Mm-hmm. And sometimes you can just lean in and say, well, if it was me, this is what I would do. And when you pose it like that, you're not taking responsibility for it. You're just saying, you're asking a question because you want my opinion or you want my ideas. So here's that. And then you kind of do with it what you want, so to speak. Yeah, it's interesting too, because I feel like we do have the ability to do these things and we have the ability to speak up. And sometimes mm -hmm. I don't necessarily know that you can and you right. know, like you're waiting for permission, but you don't have to, like you have the ability to do it and right. you just have to do it and create your own way. And like you said, you know, and I'm just guessing based on the way that you told me and the fact that you're still successfully employed, that it worked out. But you said, you know, like it was a definitive shift for two years and you've been in your current job for well over two years. Yes. So, you know, it doesn't seem like anything really changed in your life. People accepted that you put those limits in place. So you yeah. could have done it a lot sooner probably, but you just yeah. didn't feel like you could. Yeah. And it's definitely a comfort thing. Like you said, you have to be comfortable setting those boundaries. And until you're comfortable, you're just not going to do it. And even if you kind of sort of say it, you're not even going to abide by your own boundaries. So if you're not abiding by it, why should everyone else? Well, that's good feedback. It really... It really is. It's so much harder than it sounds just saying it. So I'm sure yeah. it took a lot of willpower on your part to. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and resetting with yourself like, nope, this is happening. This is happening. This is happening. Yep. Until you get to yeah. the, like the 50, it probably gets like a, you know, it's tougher, tougher, tougher to do it. And then you're like, okay, okay. It's easier. It's easier. We, we've passed the threshold. Mm -hmm. Yep. It, it was definitely a roadmap and, <laughs> and you had to check it off as you go. It was definitely a roadmap to get to that point, but it's, it's very, very important as a woman. It's very important as a mom, even if you're not a mom, even if you're just a caregiver for your own parent or parents or grandparents, it's definitely important for you to set those boundaries. Um, and honestly, try your best to set those boundaries as soon as you can versus later down the road, simply because it's harder to change behaviors, not just for yourself, but for others too, um, because you let them kind of navigate in these waters for so long. So now you are not the only one making that transition. You're having to help the people around you make that transition too, which makes it harder the longer it takes for you to actually put your foot down, so to speak. You told me before that you have a daughter that has health issues. Mm -hmm. How do you manage being a working mom and you know handling that too? Because obviously mom is the most important part of that working mom, but you're trying to yep. do both. How do you manage that? I have, that was definitely a challenge too, just like all the other parts of just being a mom. Um, but my daughter, my youngest, she's epileptic. She's been epileptic since she was about six months old. And honestly, doctors don't like using that term when they're that young, but essentially that's what she has been since six months. Um, and I had to pretty much say that it's okay to put down a hat to put that mom hat on, um, that I'm human, that I didn't ask for my daughter to have this illness, neither did she. It's just the hands that, she, you know, the cards that she was dealt. Um, and that if I am around others, whether it's work life or personal life that can't accept the fact that I'm gonna have to, you know, shift gears and literally at any given moment, then that's probably not who I need in my circle. That one was a lot easier for me because mommy kicks in quicker than anything else. You're a woman and then you're a mom. Um, so being able to just say, listen, I can't, I won't, this is the situation, and that's it. I've been blessed to say that I've had a great support system from a employment standpoint, from you know those that I work with, 
as well as in my personal life. I've had a, a great safety net, um, a great circle of people that I can trust and actually don't feel mistreated or feel like I'm a failure if I have to drop the ball when this comes up. I know when my daughter was in the NICU, I was just like, I don't care about anything. I'm going to be in this NICU every okay. single day as long as she's here. And I don't care what anybody says. This is my job. This is where yep. I need to be. And I was super lucky that like you, I had people, you know, both at work and at home that understood that was it. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I didn't really care, you know, like I, I'm probably going to do a whole separate video on this, but post preemie, pre pandemic, you know, like everybody understood that the hygiene in our house, like you're going to do a two minute scrub down. Your phone is getting taken off of you. Like you have something in the TSA line, yep. <laughs> you, you know, get it together. Cause if you're coming in this house and you're getting near this baby, you're going to be doing a temperature check. Like, oh, yep. Shit's happening. Yep. yep. You know, and, and that's you definitely, definitely where it was for Camille too, because in her early onset parts of having seizures, she was prone to getting a seizure because of her fever. So naturally, you know, the body's trying to fight something off. So we got to a point where we had to be really strategic about like the cleanliness and the hygiene of not just us, but the people who she comes in contact with. So I definitely agree with you there. It's like, it literally morphed the way how you do things in your house when you have a sick kid. It's crazy how that happens. Sometimes yeah. life throws things at you and you're like, okay, this is the world I'm living in. Yeah. People are like, how are you doing it? And you're like, can I opt out? <laughs> exactly. Like, where did I get the option? I uh -huh. didn't know that. Oh, hmm. You know, like my 2015 was like the year of nightmares. I, I don't even really look back at it as a bad as a bad year, but like sometimes we do, but like, it can't be 2015. Like this can't be worse than 2015, which is funny. Right. Now we're living in 2020 and shit's getting real. Yeah, but yeah. 2015 was still like, I mean, that's like my Britney hair shaving year. You know, <laughs> everything happened. There were like literally like six or eight people who died in my family. My daughter, you know, I had started the year off on a miscarriage in January with on my husband's birthday and then ended up having my daughter got sick myself. And then she had to be delivered early. My dad got cancer. All the people died. My dad died right after she got home from the NICU. I, I'm, it was just like the craziest year. You don't really have the option. Like you just, you have to do it. You have to figure out a way to do it. Yep. And, and then, and honestly too, like when people ask you, like, how do you do it? You don't even really know how to answer that because it's like, well, how do I not do it? You know what I mean? Like, I don't know what the real answer is to tell you how I've been doing, except I've just been doing it. Mm -hmm. It's almost like you have to just start like, all right, I'm going to give you a big net and I'm going to throw 48 balls at you and just catch them. Just figure it out. Yep. Don't let it hit your face. <laughs> you know, and that's what it is. Cause it's, that's just that's how exactly what it is. Whoa, 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 whoa. Okay. 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 All right. I, get, I got it. How'd you do it? I don't know. I don't know. You know, the adrenaline fear. Yep. Yeah. Yep. It works. It's weird. Yeah, it does. You also are very into writing. I started writing when I was a lot younger and poetry was my thing then. Um, <laughs> but I've always used writing as a way of expression. Um, I don't know, just kind of being the younger girl, the, the baby girl in the house, you kind of feel like your voice isn't as big as your older siblings. So I just started writing and I've been writing literally ever since then. What's your goal? To finish the Stern book. <laughs> tell me about your book so you have three written so far two and a half two and a half um so I have this one that I wrote and it's kind of like a mesh of multiple stories so different women um and just their story and the second book is going to be a break off of one of the characters. And then the third book is a break off of one of the characters. So once I'm finished with the entire series, how it'll look is that final book will be how all of these women story intertwine with each other. Oh my God. That sounds amazing. Yeah. When are we going to read this? What are you doing? What's the next step? <laughs> 
hopefully, hopefully, at least by the end of the year, I'll have the first book completely signed, sealed, and delivered and packaged for someone. Even if it's me kind of doing it myself first round and maybe getting picked up by a publishing company later on, that's fine. But if not, if I have to spearhead the entire thing myself, I'm okay with doing it because I know it's like, it's really, really good stories. The end result, I think, is what matters the most. Being able to say, huh, I worked hard, but I did it. I pulled that off. Okay, so what's next? Are they excited for you to publish this? Yeah, they're ready for me to have more free time. And actually, not only just the free time, but like the way my eyes light up when I talk about what I, you know, what I'm doing, they, I think they're ready to see that. And not that, you know, working a normal nine to five, they don't see that, but it's, it's just different when you get to see your parent or your loved one do something that they really, really love. And you can really, really tell, like, that's what makes their heart sing. Um, yeah, I, I think they're excited about that. Have they read it? No. No? No. And will they get to? No. <laughs> when they're adults, they'll get to it. They can read it when they're an adult. When they're 18 and above, go for it. Right now, no. You were saying about pursuing passions and why and not to limit yourself. And you always have great mm -hmm. advice on that. What do you tell others and what do you tell yourself when you're thinking of that? That it's not always about the money. It's you literally have to find something, like I said, that makes your heart sing every day. And like I tell my kids, it's not rainbows and Skittles every day. That's just not realistic. But looking at the big picture, does your heart skip a beat about what it is that you're doing? And if it does, then you're on the right track. If you're not, then maybe you're not. Um, oftentimes as adults, as human beings, period, we just think about the monetary standpoint. It's like, okay, well, I want this house and I want this car and I want to be able to go on these vacations. Does this job align with what I'm trying to do? And yeah, you know, it's, it's great to start off that way to have that goal and that mindset. But the older you get in long term, you just find it beneficial to your mental just to literally have something that you're doing every day that you're passionate about. There'll be roadblocks, um, but I mean, that's life, right? But just being able to say that I really love doing this. This is what makes my heart sing. I'm excited to get up in the morning and do this. I'm making a difference. And even if you feel like you're not making a difference to someone else, you're making a difference to yourself. Um, so yeah, that's, that's definitely the advice that I give. Like, don't always look at that picture and just say, what am I getting out of it from a monetary standpoint? What are you getting out of it overall? I feel like that doing this, you know, I had a corporate job. I worked with you and mm -hmm. I probably would have never left that job just because it was comfortable and I knew how to do it. And I'd been there close to a decade, mm -hmm. but this is what I've always wanted to do. My background was news and broadcasting, but I always wanted a talk show from the time that I was 11. I think to myself, okay, if you're willing to do this, like it makes you happy and you're treating this like a job, you know, a mm -hmm. career. Mm -hmm without getting paid, then you must be on the right track. Where do you see yourself then? If you have these books, you said by the end of the year, you are going to have at least the first one published. Yeah. So where are you going to be in five years? Five years, I will be continuing to write books, but that'll be more on a full-time scale. Um, I'll be able to do public speaking and, um, you know, maybe some sessions where I'm helping, you know, coach or mentor some youth. Like there's so many different things that fall under my umbrella for five years. But what I can definitely say is five years from now, it'll definitely be me living up the potential of all of my creativeness. I believe that. And I can't wait to read these books. They sound amazing. And now yeah. I'm curious if they're 18 and <laughs> Yeah, I'm, I'm excited to. I'm excited to now, like, have it in my mind to do it and have timelines. How do you motivate yourself to keep going when there have to be times that you're tired or something comes up with your kids and you're just like, all right, the checklist is full. The paper has ended. What now? Right. How right. do you keep going? Pretty much just remembering that the end of the tunnel 
there's so much light. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? Like actually being able to say that granted, I didn't get a lot of time being a working mom with my oldest. Um, but I'll actually be to a point in the years of me doing these things where I have a lot more time with my youngest. Um, and even with my middle kid too, I'll still get some, some time in with her too, some precious years in with her. But just being able to say, you know, I, I started here, but this is where I'm going. And there's light at the end of the tunnel and I'm not going to be chained to a desk in the, you know, in the end. So having that freedom and that flexibility is what keeps motivating me. I don't have to punch into a time clock you know, when I want to go to a football game or when I go, want to go to a dance recital, just that freedom and that flexibility is what I'm looking forward to the most. And I think that's what constantly keeps me going. That's awesome. Well, thank you so, so much for doing this. I really, You're really welcome. Been hearing about all this. So thank you guys for watching. I hope you enjoyed it too and learned a lot about LaFonda and we'll talk to you next week. Bye.